that they could not go into the home of a, of a Gentile or else they would be defiled. Now, can you see the hypocrisy of this? Here they are, they're bringing the precious Son of God before Pilate. Their whole intention is to have Jesus murdered. And here we are, we're not gonna go inside so that we can be clean before God and we can partake of the Passover meal. Do you see the hypocrisy of that? Do you see the hypocrisy of religion? These man-made uh, traditions that they had enforced upon themselves? The hypocrisy to me is almost repulsive. Here they are, an example of what Jesus said when he said they are straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. And again, when he called them whitewashed tombs, they are clean on the outside, but on the inside they are full of dead bones. So they're careful not to break some tiny nitpicky rule that they had created, and yet they're here to be a part of a murder to be a part of a murder. You know, there are people today who seem to think the same way. We're careful to observe all the do's and don'ts of our traditions while we're neglecting the most important commands, like loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, loving your neighbor as yourself. There's so many things that we do in the name of religion that really violate loving God and loving other people. You know, we have our own code of ethics, our own dress code. We don't dress, certain, we don't wear our hair, we don't put certain things on our body, and we judge other people who do. When God says, you're to love me with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. God made it very clear. He said, I desire compassion rather than sacrifice. The Jews thought they could please God without loving God and without loving people. They were wrong. And church, we're wrong if we think we can please God without loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind and without loving our neighbor as ourself. What a great way to love our neighbor, to be a missionary to our neighbors, to be called of God, sanctioned by the church, set apart by the church, to reach our neighborhoods for Christ. They expect to please God while they murder God's son. Can we expect to please God when we neglect the commands of God to love him and to serve one another? Too many of us are content just to suit up and show up every Sunday thinking that we're pleasing God. When God says, Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is that you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and that you love your neighbor as yourself. They were guilty of pitiful, pitiful hypocrisy. Secondly, we see the Jews rebel against Pilate's authority, verse 29 and 30. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. I mean, is that a very respectful way to respond to the governor? What are you accusing this man of? Governor, if he wasn't guilty, we wouldn't bring him to you. See, the truth is the Jews had very little respect for Pilate. Not only did they not respect him, they hated him. But the main issue here is the respect. See, just a quick history lesson. When Pilate became governor, he paraded into Jerusalem with all the pomp and circumstance of a conquering uh, general or something, but he came into Jerusalem and he put up all these pictures of Caesar. And you know, the Romans worshiped Caesar. And so what he did in essence is he put up all these pictures of a false God. And the Jews said, you gotta take that down. You gotta take those pictures down. We're not gonna have any false gods here in Jerusalem. Now Pilate actually lived in Caesarea. That was the, the county seat or the courthouse or the capital, if you will. That was the seat of government was Caesarea. But he put all these things up in Jerusalem and they said, you gotta take them down. He said, no. So all these Jews followed Pilate back to Caesarea. When they got to Caesarea, they were still protesting. Hundreds, if not thousands of Jews surrounded the palace. And they said, you gotta take these pictures down. They're false gods. Pilate herded everybody to the amphitheater. He put all these Jews in the amphitheater. He surrounded them with Roman soldiers. And he said, okay, here's the deal. If you don't go home right now, you're gonna die. You're gonna die. You know what the Jews did? 
stuck their neck out. Go ahead, cut our head off. We'll die. We'll die. And so Pilate was kind of painted into a corner. What would Rome think if he killed such a large segment of his subjects his first week in office? So what did he do? He backed down. He said, okay, okay, I'll take them down. I'll take them down. And so the Jews won. Several years later, another similar incident. He put up, he established a residency there in the Herod's palace. And he put up pictures of, of Caesar or Tiberius, the emperor Tiberius in his home. The Jews said, you got to take them down. He refused. So they exercised their right as Roman subjects. They appealed to Rome just like Paul would later on. He appealed to Rome. And you know what happened? The emperor sided with the Jews and said, Pilate, you got to take those things down. So again, they won. So this is just kind of painting a picture. They had no respect for this man. They had no respect for his authority. And that's really what Pilate was. He was a man who lacked backbone. He had no leadership ability. He was a man who lacked the backbone to do what was right. So they just brush him off. If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. They didn't want justice. They wanted permission to kill Jesus. They wanted an execution. Pilate was ready to conduct a trial. He knew Roman law. A man could not die unless he went through and had a proper trial. So he was ready to conduct a trial. The Jews just wanted Jesus murdered. But it's ironic, isn't it? They needed Pilate. They couldn't do what they wanted to do without his permission. And again, as we look at Scripture, last week we looked at the stark contrast between Jesus and Peter. Now we look today at the contrast between Jesus and Pilate. Now here's Jesus, verse 29 and 30, the same two verses. Jesus reveals Himself as a perfect priest. Same verses. What are, his, what are the accusations against this man? The Jews did not answer. They said, if he were not an evil man, we wouldn't have brought him to you. So in essence, they said, we don't have any accusations against this man. We don't have any accusations against this man. You know why? Because there were none. Jesus was the perfect man. Jesus was totally innocent. Jesus reveals himself in Scripture in three capacities. As prophet priest and king. Jesus is prophet as he speaks for God. Jesus is priest as he stands before God on behalf of men, representing man. And to do that, he must be a man. And then Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. Jesus rules as God. He is king. And we'll see that in just a moment. But here, I want you to see the innocence of Jesus. See, what was the role of a priest? The priest was to be a holy man who would intercede between God and man on behalf of man. The priest was the one who would enter to the Holy of Holies and he would offer the sacrifice. He would be the one who would put the blood of the animal on the altar for the people, for the sins of the people. And so what did Jesus do? Jesus offered the sacrifice for sin once and for all, didn't he? But did he offer the blood of animals? No. He offered his own blood. Unblemished and spotless, Peter said. But as the role of the the priest, he offered the blood on the altar as the holy man of God. But his blood had to be without blemish and without without spot, didn't it? And so that's what we see in this passage, that Jesus is totally innocent. If you don't believe that, look at Pilate's verdict. 